yeah. <laughs> Give it up for the Raider Band one more time, please. <laughs> thank you guys so much for being here. And thank you all for coming out. Um, I look around today, there's so many familiar faces here who have lived this story. Um, in a lot of ways, it doesn't need much of an introduction. Um, and I just can't thank you all enough for those of you who, you know, who I'm talking to for letting me into your lives and, uh, and having the courage to, to share this story with the world. Um, you wouldn't know what to look over here, but um, public education is our most pressing political, social, and moral problem. Everybody knows it, and positions are entrenched, and there's a lot of hot rhetoric on all sides. Somehow we've gotten to a point where frustration has built to such a fever pitch that we've turned on teachers as the villains and started shutting down schools all over the country. As a writer, after a good story to tell, I went looking in the pressure cooker of a public high school working against the clock to raise test scores. And I wanted to take a look at what we're throwing away in this big national purge. Instead, I found a dynamic principal leading a group of passionate, dedicated teachers at a school with a proud tradition to rally the community, community around. I found a scramble to help a surprisingly savvy group of kids who've been largely abandoned by the system. Um, as most of you probably know, the, the book traces the pivotal 2009-2010 school year at Reagan High and weaves in uh, a lot of its history. Not all, but a lot. Um, at that point, just to kind of set the stage, the school was rated academically unacceptable by the state ag education agency, four years running. Um, this has a number of very practical, real-world effects. Perhaps most important is that letters are sent home to parents saying, hey, you know, you don't have to send your kids here. You can send them right across the highway. Um, that leaves a cast of students who, in some cases, don't have the resources to get out, that have kind of been abandoned by the system, and in some cases, have too much loyalty to get out because their big brothers and sisters went to Reagan High, because their parents or aunts and uncles went to Reagan High. Um, at the moment where I came in and started doing research for the book and planning to follow this do or die school year with a kind of ticking clock where it was clear that that um, scores had to come up or the school was going to get shut down. Um, I chose to follow, to profile three principal people that you, that you meet in the book um, who had all been brought to this largely abandoned place for very different reasons. Um, the principal, Annabelle Garza, who was starting her second year in the job at the time, um, had come to devote herself to education and helping kids through um, overcoming some personal tragedies early in her life. Um, Candace Kaiser, a uh, chemistry teacher that you get to know in the book, um, was drawn to a commitment to the school through her evolving Christian faith. And Derek Davis, a history teacher who's probably better known in my neighborhood as the basketball coach at Reagan High, um, was uh, there because it was his school. He, uh, he had been a star on the basketball team uh, back in, when I was in high school, um, in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, when, it, when he came time to teach, this, this was just the natural place. Um, so at that point, at the beginning of the 2009-2010 school year, test scores are abysmal. Um, that rating is in place. Graduation rates are what you'd imagine them to be in that, at that point. But Annabelle identified what she called a heartbeat in the school. And that has something to do with history. Um, as many of you know, Reagan High School has a proud tradition rooted in consecutive state football championships in the 60s, that's 5A. Um, Nation Schools Magazine swooped in and pronounced Reagan High the school of the year when it opened in 1965, raved about the architecture. Um, I know. 
<laughs> this was a, a place that people cared about, you know, no matter how uh, buried it had gotten, there was what, what Annabelle had, and others identified as, as a heartbeat there. And they set about trying to not just raise scores this, in this one year, and that's a Herculean task in itself. Um, so during the, the kind of forms the narrative of the book, we follow Annabelle and these teachers trying to scramble to raise test scores in one year, while at the same time recognizing, like so many other high schools and in, in middle schools un, under these kind of troubles all over the country, just making the test score numbers isn't going to bring things back to the point where the madrigal singers are touring Europe and you know, the statesmen's printing their account of the continent and uh, anyhow. Um, so, so they set about trying to set the groundwork for something closer to the public school that many of us who are a little bit older cherish the memory of going to. I mean, some of us talk about our high schools. I went to a public high school just uh, north of Dallas in Farmer's Branch. It, it, uh, in reverential terms, we, we, we use the phrase alma mater, my other mother. Um, it's a big thing to say about a, a place you went to school, and it, it's, it's probably not something we're giving our kids a chance to say. Anyhow, um, everybody knows the ending of the story. They, they make the numbers, uh, and that's not, of course, the ending, really. That's the end of the book, but it's not the end of the story. Um, at the end of the book, I think this dramatic human story of this astonishing success points to some more profound issues that we need to face for our own kids. And, and this book essentially tells the story of the best that our most devoted, passionate educators can accomplish under the system we've set up. It's an inspiring story, but I also hope it makes you really angry. So I'm going to read um, two short passages, one a little less shorter than the other. <laughs> um, and then we're going to get um, Annabelle and Candace and Derek up here to, to take questions with me, if you all have questions for any of us, and then we'll, do, we'll sign your books. So we're starting on the, um, this is the very short passage, <laughs> we're starting on the First day of school in 2009, and Annabelle Garza has just finished um, making the morning announcements. Annabelle put the microphone down. Her office looked like a sublet. Other than pictures of her own children, she had managed to hang little more than an outdated portrait of the city skyline taken before the, all the new condo towers went up, a whiteboard to be used in planning 900 student schedules after one of the assistant principals tried to do it on a computer. And of course, that hadn't worked out because Annabelle didn't trust computers much. And a sign that said, sometimes you just have to take the leap and build your wings on the way down. There hadn't been much time to decorate. The lobby's trophy case looked like a time capsule. Newer photos showed charity scholarship winners flashing wads of play cash. A sign written with a felt marker proclaimed, Raiders Raid Knowledge. A week ago, with the superintendent's visit looming, Annabelle had finally taken one of the guidance counselors aside and asked, Karstarfen will be here Monday. What do we need to make this presentable? Money. So Annabelle went digging in her purse to pay for a trip to Ikea and then walked across the courtyard picking up trash, muttering, the other principals are not doing this right now. <laughs> the other principals also didn't have their younger sisters moving in to take care of their 10-year-old daughters so they could spend more time at the high school, but Annabelle did. Most nights, she was out past dark, negotiating with missionaries to open a social services center on campus, trying to fill a job called School Improvement Facilitator, and making mental lists of who was missing books, who was missing desks, and who was just missing. <laughs> so what's the drama, Annabelle said, opening a last-minute staff meeting. Can I give you the short version, an assistant principal asked, scanning a detailed email concerning a science teacher's informal largesse and the jealousy it had inspired. Ms. Kaiser gave her beat-up cafeteria tables to Ms. Bauer. Somebody suggested confiscating all the furniture from the science wing. That'd show them. Annabelle laughed her head back laugh. Learning happens in many different ways, she said. I'm just saying. <clears throat> but even something this silly could get out of hand, and she knew it. The way resources were stretched, the pressure everybody was under, the science teachers especially. That was where scores...